Honorable Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, Richard Panafleck, Ava Lista de Weaver, Department Head of Collective Prevention Services, CPS, Brachia Butikes, Operations Manager, White and Yellow Cross Foundation, Dr. Anand Rago Singh, General Practitioner, Professor Dr. Deitz, Pro Professor Dr. Ashley Deitz, Medical Immunologist, Online viewers and radio listeners via St. Martin of Radio 107.9 FM and respective radio stations island wide. Good evening. I'm Rolika Roach of the Department of Communication and on behalf of the government of St. Martin, I welcome you to this virtual panel discussion today, Thursday, February 11th, 2021, with regards to the vaccination against the COVID-19 virus on St. Martin. To open this discussion, I would like to invite the Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, the Honorable Richard Panafleck, to address you. Minister Panafleck, you have the virtual floor. Thank you. Good evening to the viewers of this live stream broadcast. As Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, I'm pleased to kick off this public information session for the COVID-19 vaccine rollout on St. Martin. Tonight, we have a panel with a whole team of public health professionals with a wealth, wealth of medical knowledge and experience that are here to answer questions and concerns about the vaccine. I would like to thank the vaccine management team and Dr. Deutz for making themselves available for this session. As the Ministry of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, we have been working day and night to ensure that Samad is prepared to receive the vaccine. Even though updates can still happen, Tonight, the rollout plan for the vaccination against the COVID-19 virus on St. Martin will be shared with you. I hope that you will find this session helpful and encourage everyone who has questions to ask them here, because that is what this meeting is for. I thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Minister Panafleck, for your opening remarks. At this time, I would like to invite Department Head of the Collective Prevention Services, Mrs. Ava Lister de Weaver, to address you. Mrs. Lister de Weaver, you have the virtual floor. Mrs. de Weaver, can you kindly unmute your mic, please? Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Rolaika, and thank you, Minister Panafleck, for the welcome. Uh, good evening to viewers on St. Martin and for those of you tuning abroad. Um, Rolaika, if I could ask that the presentation be projected so that I can go ahead and start with that, please. Great, thank you so much. So tonight as the head of CPS and a member of the vaccine management team, our aim for tonight's presentation is to walk you through some basic information about vaccines, how they are developed and why they are important from a public health perspective. We will end the presentation by providing information on how you can sign up to receive the COVID-19 vaccine on St. Martin and then open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Deitz. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Lisa De Waver. And thanks for the invitation and thanks for the opportunity at the very important uh, part of this whole program. Um, if we're talking about uh, vaccines, uh, we, need to re we need to realize that vaccines are actually the most effective and most successful medical intervention we know. Uh, what we know now by experience that making use of vaccines, we are saving two to three million lives per year without counting, of course, the COVID vaccines we're going to discuss. So it's a very successful medical intervention with a lot of mortality reductions. And there are two graphs we just show where you can see that we have been using vaccines already for decades. So we have chosen a way to deal with a virus, as in this case, the COVID-19 virus, with a well-known system. As you can see in those graphs, we have affected different types of diseases already and also eliminated them, like polio, if you see in the, in, the, in the 60s, by introduction of vaccination, it almost completely disappeared. And the same holds true through another disease, just as an example, like diphtheria, where 
vaccine was introduced in 1940. So making again use of vaccines is something very common and the effects are enormous. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So what these vaccines do, they, they make your body produce a protein that looks like the coronavirus protein. So you're actually simulating an infection without becoming sick. So your immune system, your defense system is triggered by this protein. You're gonna make a resistance. Your immune response is gonna make a resistance, partly called antibodies against the virus. So the next time you see the real thing, you're ready to go. So the moment the virus comes in, you're not going to get sick. You're going to defend yourself immediately with all the positive effects we expect without becoming sick by a normal infection. So in that case, how safe are vaccines and how are they developed? Well, vaccines are very safe. As, I, as we show in this figure, before being available on the market and for patients and persons, it goes through a different phases for what we call the clinical, clinical trials, where, where we look at safety, we look at efficacy, and we look at the quality. So you go from a preclinical phase to phase one, where you look at the safety. So you, you, you analyze the effect of the vaccine for safety on a small group of participants. You then go to phase two, where you start looking at the safety, and looking at anything else, the dosage, that's phase two for a, a bigger proportion of uh, participants. And then you go to phase three, which is a huge amount of uh, persons you're gonna test. And that's called phase three, where you look at the effectiveness of the vaccine. In the case of the vaccine you're gonna get in St. Martin, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, that was tested before coming on the market on a group of about 40,000 persons with a lot of positive effects. Can we just go back one slide, please? So when it's finished, when everything is okay, it's published, then it goes to the regulatory uh, agencies in each and every country to look at the data they generated and see that it's safe. When it's safe and the safety is confirmed by, for instance, the FDA in the United States and EMA in Europe, then it becomes available for uh, the whole population, which is now going to happen in St. Martin. And then you go into phase four. So this effect, this whole process has been done already. So the, the vaccine you're going to get is a very, very safe vaccine. One question that came up and we would like to immediately address is the fact that how is it possible that this has been done in a year's time? Wasn't that too too fast? Was it that we, did we skip anything? No, we didn't skip anything. Secondly, we had new techniques available. And thirdly, there's something we need to realize that for the first time, a virus was a big threat for rich countries, for Western countries, in which they invested billions of dollars in EUs to get the vaccine as soon as possible for them and, of course, for us to be back to the normal as we want in a much shorter period of time. Next slide, please. Next slide. So that's the aspect of the vaccine. That's the safety. There's a personal issue. So you want to get a vaccine so you don't become sick. And we need to realize that that sickness is not only going to the hospital, but what we know right now is something that we call long-term COVID. That means that after you've become sick, after you went to the hospital and you're coming back, there are still some remnant disease we have that up until six months, you'll be uh, having that, those uh, symptoms. So that's the individual aspect. The more uh, social and public health aspect is that we want to have sufficient coverage of all persons to get herd immunity. With having herd immunity, the virus cannot exist in your community anymore, and it's not gonna be a factor. So there's a sense of urgency of having much more people, a high amount of people, about 70% to 80% vaccinated and protected, that means that the virus will not get back into your community. So it's from a personal perspective, you are not becoming sick, but by vaccinating, you're protecting your whole community. And that's extremely important to realize. Next slide, please. So what's the experience now with, uh, with, with the vaccine? I mean, those were theoretical and, 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 and uh, scientific research. What we now know by experience is, I just want to give you an example, 
the vaccine was rolled out in Israel. So Israel rolled out the vaccine in December and it had a sense of urgency in vaccinating its whole population. So at the, at the end of January, about 70% of persons aged 70 plus were vaccinated, which is about 30% of the population. As you can see and on the right hand side in the graph, this resulted in a tremendous effect of daily infections. What you see is the blue line is for the vaccinated person, so the 70 plus. You see a reduction of about 35 to 40 percent in one month's time. And if you look at the right side hand side graphics, you're going to see the hospital admissions. And you see the blue line are the ones vaccinated. You see a reduction of about 40 percent, whereas the ones that were not vaccinated, so the ones in the age bracket between zero and 59 years, still remained at the same amount of people being admitted to the hospital. So within a month's time, having a high vaccination campaign and adhering to that has a tremendous effect already by experience in Israel. So imagine if you can pull this off in St. Martin, it would be great and it would have a tremendous effect and an immediate effect. Next slide, please. So those, uh, what, what we're going to get actually from a vaccine, what we're going to get from Pfizer is a lipid construction called a liposome with some genetic information of the virus in it. You're going to be injected with that as a vaccine and your body is going to make just that little protein of the virus that is important to being recognized. So you're not going to be injected with the virus, you're just going to be infected with one small genetic information of that virus and you're going to produce that protein, you're going to make antibodies and then when you see the real thing, when you see the real virus, you're completely protected. And what we need to realize is that these vaccines we're getting are very scarce. So there's a, there's a lack of amount of vaccines in the world. So we're actually what we're getting we're privileged. We're very privileged because for the rest of the world, there is a scarcity of vaccines. So again, there's another argument of using this vaccine because of the fact that we're also privileged to use. And there are a lot of countries that are not getting any vaccines. Next slide, please. So again, for a vaccine to work, it has to be safe. They have been vigorously tested, as I explained to you. The, the, the safety, we're going to discuss that not only in the studies, but what and one other part that is very, very important from these vaccines, they're very effective. So what we know of Pfizer vaccine is that 95% of efficacy is reached after the second dose. And I'll explain that just in just a sec. That means that in of 100 persons vaccinated, 95 will be protected, which is extremely important. What you see in the graph on the right hand side is the necessity of two shots. So the initial vaccination will give you an initial protection, but with the second shot, you get like a booster and that will make you almost unbeatable for the virus. So you need two shots to be at the top of your game and to be completely protected. Next slide, please. So what is the experience of the safety? And I'm just going to show you some figures of the uh, overview of the United States that was published last month. And they looked at 22 million people already uh, vaccinated. And what they saw in those two, 22 million people are uh, uh, side effects that we would expect because when you get vaccinated, there are some side effects to be expected. For instance, mild pain at the point of injection, some headache, some tiredness, some fever, some muscle and joint pain, but those are good signs. Those are signs that your immune system, your resistance is working, it's activating. So what we see with that is that in all of those 22 million people, we saw the same effects. Again, mild effects that'll, that'll disappear in one or two days, but giving us the important sign that the vaccine is working. And that was already reflected in those 22 million people. Can I have the next slide, please? What about other side effects. What about side effects we don't want? Well, you probably heard that one of the side effects you won't, you're not, you're not expected to see are allergic reactions. So the allergic reactions are something we need to take into account. 
And in the vaccine program that St. Martin is going to roll out, you're probably going to hear that after each vaccination, you're going to be observed for about 15 minutes. That's because of the fact that there is a chance of an allergic reaction. How high that chance is, it's actually very, very low. What we see about 2020 in those 22 million people who got the vaccine, about 50 of them got an allergic reaction, 50. That means five in a million, or put it in another way, 0.5 persons in 100,000 vaccinees. So you're, we don't expect any high incidence of allergic reactions. We just want to be sure because if you win the lottery and you're, you're the one, you're going to be helped immediately. But again, it's extremely safe and the reported side effects are at a very, very low frequency, but if you're going to be observed as to be completely safe. Next slide, please. I can, that's, I'm going to hand it over again to Mrs. Lista the waiver. That's in a general sense the message I wanted to convene to all of you listening at this moment in time. Thank you so much, Dr. Deutz. Uh, I think that information was extremely helpful um, and I hope that um, persons do keep their questions in mind. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be having a question answer session after this presentation. So similar to other countries in the world, uh, St. Martin has set priority groups to first receive the vaccine. The first priority group will be given to healthcare professionals and then persons who are over age 60 years. And once this group is vaccinated, the next groups will follow. Now, in terms of vaccination locations, we will first roll out our COVID-19 vaccination clinics, first at the Vineyard Building, which is where CPS is located, and then subsequently to Colby Community Help Desk and the Dutch Quarter Community Help Desk. Now, in terms of the vaccine procedure, and uh, similar to what Dr. Deitz alluded to, uh, the each location will have a, a process and this is just outlining the simple process. So you would be um, invited in for your vaccine after you register and you will go through a temperature tech check along with a health questionnaire to ensure that you are feeling healthy and able to receive the vaccine. Once uh, you get the temperature check, you will go through a registration and a health check, and then we will obtain um, your consent. You will be um, asked to uh, go into a separate room to receive the vaccination. And as Dr. Deitz mentioned, after the vaccine is administered, you will be monitored by a medical team for 15 minutes. And then after that, you will be given your second appointment um, and that would be given through SMS or email. Now, everyone has been asking, how do I register? And so to facilitate those who are tech savvy, we have provided a registration portal. Um, and the, email, the portal address is on, the, on this slide, which will also be disseminated publicly subsequently after this meeting. Um, and for those who might not have the techno technological means or the capacity to fill out the registration link digitally. We will also be providing paper-based registration forms, which can be, uh, which will be offered at your doctor's office. Um, if you have a doctor, uh, select pharmacies and government locations. Once we have a, a full, a complete list of where these paper registration forms can be available, we will make that known through the government of St. Martin's Facebook and website. And essentially, with the registration link or the paper based, you will be instructed to fill out uh, some basic information along with providing a copy of your ID to verify your age. And then you will receive your appointment details via WhatsApp or if you've provided an email address through email. 
Now, uh, this is, I believe, the final slide of the presentation. And what we want to convey to everyone uh, tuned in is that um, we, our overall objective for the COVID vaccination strategy on St. Martin is that we would like to vaccinate at least 70% of our population on St. Martin before the start of hurricane season. And while this is an aggressive task, um, we want to be able to ensure that we have the coverage we need um, before hurricane season gets here. Hopefully it will be a, a mild season. Um, and this is why we are pushing to get this done very actively. Our aim is to roll this out um, in the last week of February um, and then publicly uh, the first week of March. And with that, I will turn it over to um, Relika to be able to field any questions. And I thank everyone for tuning in. And I hope that you find this information was helpful. My apologies. Thank you once again, Mrs. Lissa DeWeaver and Dr. Dice for that information. If you've just joined us, you are watching a panel discussion with regard to the vaccination for the COVID-19 virus on St. Martin for today, Thursday, February 11th, 2021. Thank you for joining us. We now move on to the question and answer session. Please take note that these questions were received in advance via the email address provided. I'll direct the first question to Dr. Dice. Can the vaccine change your DNA? No, the vaccine will definitely not change your DNA. The vaccine we're going to get is an RNA vaccine, which is another language, another type of genetic information. So that can never interfere with your own genetic information that's DNA based. So in no way that'll change your DNA. And again, this is just a vaccine. You imagine because the fact that when you're you're uh, infected with a virus, you're also infected with the same type of RNA, and that's not going to make any difference for your DNA. So there's no difference. Your DNA is not going to change. Thank you, Dr. Deitz. Uh, next question is directed to Dr. Rago Singh. Who cannot receive the vaccine and why? Well, we have a group of people who are not able to receive the vaccination. And the main reason mostly is that they are, the safety of the vaccination has not been examined in those subgroups as yet. So one of the groups who are not uh, safe to receive the vaccination yet are women who are pregnant. Um, we will not be able to give the vaccination yet to any children under the age of 18. We will not be giving the vaccination to women who are breastfeeding. We will not give the vaccination to those who had a severe reaction to the first vaccination. If you get the vaccination and the first one gives you a reaction, we should not proceed with the second vaccination. <coughs> then we will not give it to those who are known with allergies to ingredients of the vaccination, which is another question which Dr. Deutz can maybe elaborate a little bit on uh, the to the ingredients, maybe. Um, who, will do, who can receive the vaccination are those who have any food allergies, any medicine allergies like antibiotic allergies or aspirin-related allergies. They can still get the vaccination without any trouble. There is no need for them to be hesitating on this. They are allowed to receive it. The, those who have an active infection with flu-like symptoms should not uh, come um, to the facilities, of course, and those who have an active COVID infection should not be vaccinated as well um, because we want to know what is the effect of the... We will not be able to see, distinguish between the effects of the vaccination and the reaction on the disease itself. So that would be an exclusion area. Then we have a group of people with autoimmune diseases, which are not, um, from which we know that most of them should be eligible to receive the vaccination and actually should be recommended to give the, receive the vaccination. But we will also um, ask them to check with their doctors 
first to make sure that they are allowed to receive the vaccination. And then the next group is those who are taking blood thinners, because if you are taking blood thinners and you get a uh, vaccination, an injection, you might have a bleeding reaction on the spot and that causes pain and swelling. So that would be that would be the group where we would recommend not to take the vaccination. Other than that, we encourage the public to take the vaccination as much as they can, because then we can protect the population. Dr. Deutsch said already, and, and Ava also mentioned, the more people we have vaccinated, the less chances of spreading we will have. So yes, these are a few of, uh, groups of people who are, should not receive the vaccination just because the studies are not being uh, done yet. But other than that, everybody should be eligible to receive it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. Following question, can an mRNA vac vaccine create an autoimmune disease? This is for Dr. Deutz. Uh, no, in uh, principle, it cannot. Uh, if you have a normal immune system, the only thing the vaccine does is it makes you react against that protein of the virus. And that protein of the virus is not of your own. It's not from your own body. So you're not going to recognize that in any other way. So that vaccine is safe and your whole immune system is geared up for that uh, uh, virus. And there's no higher risk of autoimmune disease. We need to realize when you get injected with that vaccine, the vaccine itself will disappear in a couple of days or mostly in a one week time. So you're, there's no remnant of anything except your antibodies that you made, which are related to your protection. So no uh, risk, higher risk of uh, autoimmune diseases. Thank you, Dr. Deutz. A uh, following question is for Ms. Brechia Butike from the White and Yellow Cross Foundation. What about the individuals that pass in the elderly home in Norway? Yes, thank you very much for that question. I mentioned that. When I saw the story, story in the paper, I immediately reacted to it and really investigated because I take care of a lot of old and frail people. And I realized after research that they are not interconnected at all. There is no evidence whatsoever that the rollout of the vaccine has caused people to die. The simple fact of the matter is that frail old people do pass away. And in nursing homes, of course, around the world, daily people die. If you look at my nursing home, the St. Martin's home, and you have an average death of maybe 12 persons a year, once a month, then if I roll out the vaccine campaign to my clients late February, you can expect that within a matter of weeks, I might have one natural death. And the media might put those things together and say, hey, you know, she rolled out the vaccine, someone died. But people do die in our nursing home. Many of them are in their last stages. And what we will do is roll out the vaccination campaign in a responsible manner, where we weigh the balance to see if someone is really, really in a very frail, ill health, if the benefits of the vaccine weigh against the possible side effects that can really, you know, cause fever, they may not drink so well for a few days, which can be, of course, a big complication for someone in a very, very frail state. So there will be some clients in my nursing home who might be too frail to take the vaccine, which is all the more reason that I'm highly motivated for my staff to take the vaccination because those people would then be protected by vaccinated staff and vaccinated family members of these clients. And then the, the illness cannot reach these persons that may be just too frail to take that vaccination. And the story is very current because just this week in our local newspaper, the Herald, was a press release from the Netherlands that 14 or 15 elderly had died there after the rollout. And that is also a case of putting us connected together because also there, frail and older people pass away. And especially in the Netherlands, it was chosen to do the rollout with the oldest people first and then work your way down towards the 60. So they started with 85 plus. And of course, that age group will have people who will die because of their uh, age and underlying conditions. So 
in a nutshell, the vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine will not cause people to die. Thank you so much, Ms. Butike. Panelists, thank you once again. We'll be right back after this short break with more questions. Vaccines saves approximately two to three million lives every year and are therefore one of the most effective medical intervention ever invented. A vaccine protects you, but additionally, it also protects your family, friends, and vulnerable people in your community. The more people get vaccinated, the harder it will be for the virus to spread. When enough people are vaccinated to create herd immunity, it can put an end to the pandemic. The government can then scale down the coronavirus restrictions and the tourists can return, which is vital for our economy. The COVID-19 vaccine will be free of charge for everyone. It is not mandatory to take the vaccine, but it is highly encouraged. If you have questions about your own specific situation, discuss them with your doctor. In the meantime, we must be responsible and keep practicing the COVID-19 safety measures like wearing your mask, washing hands, and maintaining social distance. This public service announcement has been brought to you by the Department of Collective Preventive Services and the Department of Communication. Chaque année, vaccins sauvés à peu près 2 à 3 millions de la vie. C'est peut-être ça l'issue d'une intervention médicale qui est plus efficace que les hommes inventés. Vaccins qui protègent, mais en plus qui protègent les familles, les amis et les gens qui sont plus vulnérables dans la communauté. Plus les gens qui prennent vaccin, c'est le principal difficile pour le virus de la gare. Les gens qui prennent vaccin, ils créent une forme d'immunité contre le virus. Là. Et puis bien peut-être qu'ils mettent en fin à la pandémie. Le gouvernement est capable de lever en peu de restrictions. Tout risque qu'à retourner, et puis c'est vraiment vital pour l'économie nous. Vaccin COVID-19 n'est pas gratuit pour tout le monde. Il n'est pas obligatoire pour prendre, mais nous vraiment encourager pour prendre. Si vous n'avez aucune question sur votre situation, discutez avec le docteur. Entre temps, nous devons prendre responsable nous et puis continuer à pratiquer mes sécurité COVID-19. Tant que mettez masque, lavez mains souvent et puis mettez distance sociale. Annonce ça, nous portons le bas par département service prévention avec département communication. Welcome back to the live panel discussion regarding the COVID-19 vaccine on St. Martin. We will now go to the rest of the questions which were retrieved from the email address as well as the Facebook live stream. The first question is for Dr. Deutz. How can the vaccine protect someone when there are different strains of the virus? Also, will this vaccine prevent other strains from making someone sick? Well, what you normally get is that when you have a good vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine is really, really good, you're making antibodies, you're making resistance for the virus completely. You're making resistance for that protein in all different aspects. So when there is a mutant, one of the aspects of that protein is different, but all other parts of the protein is the same. So your resistance is actually composed of different antibodies against different parts of that virus. So if one of them changes, one of those parts changes, you are still able to protect yourself because the other parts are the same. So in that sense, what we know right now is the fact that the Pfizer, the ones you're getting, is the one that even with the new mutations we're seeing is still effective in protecting against that viral infection. But what we're also saying is you need to get vaccinated as a, as a population, the earlier the better, because then all of those mutants will not have a chance to replicate in your community. So you're gonna be protected, but by having a lot of people protected, don't let viruses come in because viruses keep on mutating but from the ones we know right now, you are protected by the vaccine that you're going to get in St. Martin. Thank you, Dr. Deutz. Next question is for either Dr. Deutz or Ms. Brachia Boutiquez. Who invented this technology? Should I take care of that, Brachia? Yeah. Well, this technology, I mean, there are two things. As I already mentioned in my presentation, vaccines exist 
have been existent all for decades. So that technique is very old. And the first person who actually made use of that is called uh, Mr. Called Mr. Jenner. Uh, but that was way back in, 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 in the last century. This new technique was invented by, so the message RNA technique was invented by a group in Germany. And that group developed this vaccine, developed the fact that you could use message RNA instead of viruses. Older vaccines were made of what we call attenuated viruses. So you would kill the virus and then you would inject that killed virus into a person in order to get that person vaccinated. And with this new technique, you only take a part of genetic information. And that was designed by a German group, BioNT, and that was made into a vaccine in liposomes and turned out to be very, very successful. Okay, Dr. Deitz, we have uh, three more questions that I think you can answer as well. The first one is, what is in the vaccine or what are the ingredients? What okay, are the harmful ingredients? And what are the harmful ingredients of the vaccine to the body? We'll start with those two. Well, let's start with the last two. Uh, those, so the, the, or the last two questions you asked, harmful, there are no harmful uh, components in the vaccine. There are some components though that the GP needs to take into account. As, uh, as uh, Dr. Ragnosin said, you need to take into account if you're allergic to that component. So they're gonna get all the information on components that are in the vaccine that normally don't have any effect. So what is the vaccine composed of? Well, for the biggest majority, the vaccine is composed of water. So that's the biggest part. Next to that, you have those lipid particles with some genetic information. And I need to remind you those lipid particles are called liposomes. And that use of liposomes is also in all the creams the ladies are using for their faces and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a technique already that you're probably being using when you're using your face creams, things like that. Only thing is now it has some genetic information of the virus. So that's the second component. Thirdly, there are some stabilizers we use. So those stabilizers are well-known compounds that stabilize the vaccine. That means that it's much more stable to use and it'll be much, effect, much more effective in your body. So those are stabilizers. And the last component we have are uh, what we call adjuvants. So those are very specific lipid particles that will give your immune system a boost. So it will wake up and say, you know what, there's something coming in. It's like a, an energy drink you're going to get into your body. So that's what we call an adjuvant. All of those components have been extremely well tested and there are no side effects. Only we need to take into account again that some of those stabilizers people can be allergic to. That's why the doctor is going to look if you have an, uh, a, a history of allergies, a real history of allergies, the doctor is going to look and see if those allergies are can be related to that compound that is in the vaccine, which normally doesn't ex doesn't have any influence. So in a big sense, it's very safe. And again, as Brechtje said, it's going to be rolled out in a very responsible manner. So together with the GP, if that's necessary, those things will be analyzed. Another question for you, Dr. Deitz, what is mRNA in the vaccine? mRNA is a name, it's, a, it's, a, it's an acronym for message RNA, and that's genetic information. So that's information that the virus uses normally to produce, to reproduce itself. So what you get is you make proteins, but those proteins are made accordingly to a genetic code. And that genetic information is like the blueprint of the virus. And the blueprint of the virus is RNA. And what we're doing with the vaccine, we're taking a little bit out of that blueprint and put it in a liposome. It's like a, it's like a map when you're building a house. So you build a house according to a map. And you would take part of the map and we, we put it in a vaccine so your body starts only making one part of the virus. You can, you can compare that to we're go just going to make one room of the whole house. And that's the message RNA. It's the blueprint of the information which we use in the uh, vaccine. Okay, we now move on to questions regarding the side effects. Will there be a public record on the total side effects on patients or even deaths? 
uh, Dr. Dice. I don't know if you will be able to answer that. Well, I'll, I'll gladly pass on that on to Dr. Ragosin because that, that should be in place. But please, doctor. Yes. Yes. Um, so everybody who uh, signs up for the vaccination will receive the vaccination, but also he, needs, he or she will be registered and also there will be nurses uh, at the spot of the vaccination, of the inoculation, who will register all reactions. It has to be registered. What that is one of the requirements from the RFM, who is uh, providing us with the vaccines, that we do this in a in a organized way, so that all we just that everybody who receives it gets uh, observed for 15 minutes after the vaccination. And those 15 minutes, if you receive, if you develop any reactions, that should be registered, so that we know how many people eventually got reactions from which vaccination on what time and how the, how severe it was. I want to also emphasize on this that there will be a doctor available at all inoculation uh, locations. So whenever there will be uh, somebody who is receiving vaccinations, they will be monitored for 15 minutes at the least. And there will be a doctor with equipment available in case of an allergic reaction. We will have medication available, we will have the number, uh, we will have uh, AP pen available, we will have a blood pressure machine available. So in case something happens, we are there. We have the medication with us, we will react to it, we will have, uh, if necessary, we will call in more help, but we will be prepared for um, event. But I want to emphasize one more time, Dr. Dice says, one zero point five zero point five persons per hundred thousand will have an allergic reaction. If we have less than a hundred thousand, chances are not so large. But no, we're not going to take any risk with nobody's help. We will be there on the spot and we will be monitoring people. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. Yep. Another question: How does one know? what will be the long-term effects of such vaccination to the public and who will determine the outcome in years to come? Can uh, I say something about this? Yes, Dr. Agassin, go ahead. I think um, that vaccinations are working very shortly. They, they're uh, very for a short time in your body. What they do is they stimulate the body to make uh, an immune response like antibodies and that is their job and then they're gone. They're not going to stay for a long term, so there will, there should not be any long term effect. Um, then again, Dr. Deutz also uh, presented some numbers. At the moment, we had more than 20 million people being uh, vaccinated in, in the U.S. We have in India three and a half million people vaccinated in um, Israel, more than six million people being vaccinated. In Holland, for instance, 12,000 doctors are being vaccinated already. So the numbers are getting coming in and we don't see severe re responses as yet, especially Dr. Deutsch presented the numbers from Israel. We see in, in contrary, we, we weigh the benefits and the negative effects from the vaccination and the positive effects. And if we look at the benefits, then we see that in Israel, the amount of admissions in the hospital has reduced significantly. The number of deaths have, uh, of illness have uh, reduced significantly in those who received. So we're looking at benefits and, uh, and uh, negative effects. And if the, ra the ratio stays like how it is at this moment, we should strongly recommend our population to take the vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. We now move on to the safety aspect of the questions that we've received. Ms. Roach? Yes, Minister. If you allow me, um, I would like to make something public, um, perfectly clear. The data collected with names and registration will not be shared with any other entity that's pure for medical purposes. So nobody has to be afraid that their information will be shared. We have seen that um, in other countries there were mishaps with that, but we are working on that and make sure we are not exchanging information with no other departments so you don't have to be afraid for anything. Come forward, 
this is a health issue and we will deal it with it only by that means. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Panafleck. Moving along with regards to the safety questions that we received, by which way was it approved under scientific studies of our health and care organization bodies done on St. Martin? That is either for Mrs. Lista De Weaver or Dr. Deutz. Mrs. De Weaver, would you like to? Well, I, I'm probably sure how you do that at St. Martin, so uh, please be, uh, be my guest. Absolutely. Um, so we did form a vaccine management team and with all of the information and communication that we have very regularly with the Netherlands, um, certain decisions were made uh, in terms of what vaccines we're getting. Um, we also look at the international scientific evidence, consulting with experts like Dr. Deutz to make sure that what we are providing to the public is a safe and uh, feasible option. Maybe I can just add to that, that what, uh, what uh, Ms. Dewever is saying, that there are agencies, international agencies like in, in Europe, the EMA and the FDA in the United States, that are actually scrutinizing all of this, monitoring all of this. So every decision the country makes can also be related to those big ag agencies that are looking at. So it's not only us or small islands, but we are connecting with much bigger agencies with much more resources. So in that sense, guaranteeing safety in a, in a, in a, in a much bigger platform than only on, uh, on our islands, which is of course very, very important to realize. Thank you, Dr. Joyce, and thank you, Mrs. Lister Weaver. We do have a general question for the entire panel. This question is coming from SXM Balance of Power, and the question is, how many on this panel will take the vaccine? Mrs. Lister De Weaver, so we have everyone here. Absolutely. I am, um, you know, I'm privileged as a as a healthcare worker and frontline worker to be one of those first eligible for the vaccine. Um, and I am dragging both of my parents and eagerly, you know, awaiting to have them sign up to be one of the first to receive it as well. I'm going to take the vaccination for sure. I think that we as healthcare workers encounter contact with patients who have COVID, uh, maybe without any symptoms yet. They come for other reasons to the clinic and they might know or they might not know that they have uh, the COVID and a couple of days later we see their results coming in and they're positive. So we are at risk all the time. I have one of my uh, friends who is an ophthalmologist who had been in the intensive care for two weeks because of COVID and he told me, Anand, if you have the opportunity, do this. And I'm going to be certainly taking this uh, vaccination. I want to protect myself. I want to protect my patients. I want to protect my family. I have my uh, mother-in-law with us who is uh, 80 years. And I want to protect my staff as well because if I, the worst thing you want in life is um, to give this, this infection to somebody else and you know you never know what the effects will be for that person. Uh, I one, cannot one, wait. One, 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 Sorry. One, one, Go ahead, Dr. Dyes. Go, Go ahead. Go ahead. Ladies first. Ladies first. Okay, I, I cannot wait uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deitz. I cannot wait to be vaccinated, um, not for myself, because I am not concerned at all that I will uh, be in the unlucky statistics of ending in the, on a ventilator in an ICU. I am vaccinating for my clients. Um, when I enter the nursing home and I have clients with Alzheimer that, that see me and that I have a close bond with, they will walk up to me and they will hug me. And there is no way I can stop them from doing that. I cannot explain them that there are COVID preventative measures that they need to adhere to. These clients love me. I love my clients. And I want to do everything I can to protect them. And when I take the vaccine, I will be more to be filmed. And we can be photographed and do it live on a Facebook stream. Because I would love to show the population how important it is to be vaccinated. I'm doing it for my clients. I'm doing it for my colleague who just recovered from breast cancer and just had intensive chemotherapy. So I'm doing it on a solidarity principle to keep everyone that I am supposed to protect safe. Yeah, I, I, those, I mean, everybody needs to realize that. So those are splendid uh, examples. There's just one thing I needed to add is that 
we need to realize on in, in St. Martin as in Curacao, we're extremely privileged. We're extremely privileged in order uh, related to the fact that we can get a vaccine. As I already mentioned, there's a tremendous scarcity. And I can tell you uh, from, from, from data that, for instance, countries in, uh, in the Caribbean and some countries in Africa are only going to get this vaccine or a vaccine in 2022. So we need to realize that also, that this possibility is being offered to us. We need to take it with both hands because other countries are not receiving anything. So again, and it'll help us go back to a new, to our no, probably normal way of life much faster than when we don't get that vaccine. So from all perspectives, it's something everybody should choose without a doubt. And we will receive it for free and we will give it to everybody who registered or not registered. Everybody living on the island will be able to receive it. I think that is, a, that is a re really a prerogative. And in case anybody doubt it, the minister will take it too, because it's of great importance, not only for the personal health, but for the health of the community, as you are part of a larger community. Thank you so much, everyone. We will now continue to move forward with our questions. Next question is, what will be the consequences if government finds out that it was wrong? I don't, don't. I think we are not unique. We just said there are about 50 million people already being vaccinated. It's not a vaccine that is made for St. Martin. It's a vaccine. It's the same vaccine, Pfizer vaccine. Actually, the one with the best grades at this moment, and mostly used because Israel has been using Pfizer. And so the numbers that are from this one are really excellent at this moment. Um, I think the fact that it is an internationally used vaccine and that it is that there are there's knowledge coming in already gives us a sense of safety. So I don't expect that it will be working differently. It has been tested on different people. It has been tested on women. It has been tested on people from different backgrounds already in the meantime. It has been tested on, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, different. Pop uh, the the uh, it's not tested on one part of the population as yet, only. So that's why um, I think we can trust it, and we have to go. Of course, there will be down the line. There will be more information. The more it's being used, there will be more information pouring in. But at this moment, I think it's not a unique product. It's not for us only. Fifty million people have received it. I think we should be safe. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. Following question, if someone dies from or if someone dies during or after the vaccine, will the family be compensated? I think it's very good to know that vaccination is, of course, similar to um, forms of medical treatment. So there is something that is called informed consent. Just as you are admitted in a hospital to remove your appendix, you will sign a form after you've been informed of the pros and cons of the procedure that you can send to the procedure to the risk of that surgery. So if something happens, you have consented to such. Vaccination is exactly the same principle. So you are well informed at the vaccine location. There's leaflets that will explain you very well the side effects, which are headache, fatigue, um, maybe some mild fever chills, so things that we all saw in our children when they were vaccinated for chickenpox and all the other uh, normal childhood vaccinations. And you are consenting uh, that you will take that vaccine and are fully aware uh, of those possible side effects. So that is important to know that you have that responsibility to make that choice for yourself. And then, of course, you are responsible for that choice. Thank you so much, Ms. Boutekes. Moving along. If the body is created per in perfect health, I stand corrected. If the body is created perfect in healing itself, why does someone need mRNA to instruct their cells to produce the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to trigger an immune response? That is between Dr. Dice and Dr. Agosin. Uh Well, I'll take care of that, uh, Dr. Agosin, right? Um, well, the point is, as I explained, a vaccine simulates an infection. So what you don't want is you don't want to become sick. So if the immune system works well 
and it works well. It's not perfect, but it, it works well. Most of us, most of us will only get mild symptoms, but we can't, we, we are not quite aware who's not, who's not going to get much more effect of the, the infection of the virus. So getting disease, going to a hospital and even dying. Most people are, uh, what we know are risk groups, but even young people that are not in risk groups can end up in the hospital. So it's a gamble. That's one. Secondly, you don't want to get infected with the virus because you don't want to become sick. So the vaccine is helping you by simulating the virus and protecting yourself, which is a very natural thing to do. I mean, I would rather protect myself by a vaccine than protecting myself by becoming sick. And in that sense, there's another aspect we now know by science that the persons who get infected that are the best protected by their immune system are actually the persons who are at the intensive care in the hospital. So the ones getting the most sickness of the disease, those are the ones much more protected by their immune system, whereas the ones who have mild disease are less protected. So again, you're gambling with something, whereas that whole gamble can be taken away by being vaccinated. And that will not make you sick and you'll have an immune system ready to go. Following question, why is the vaccine being introduced on St. Martin when there are so few deaths and infections? To address that question, please. Um, I think St. Martin is a tourism based, has a tourism based um, economy. Our main source of income is tourism. And uh, with tourism, you get an influx of people who come with a COVID test. But all of us know that sometimes you get a negative COVID test today, but if you test the person again three days later, they have become positive. So that, uh, and you have people who come in with a silent infection. We will have no symptoms at that moment. So for, in order for us to be opening up our borders and our airport and our uh, uh, port, to uh, accept and to welcome uh, passengers, tourists, then we need to protect ourselves one way or another. And I think that the uh, vaccination is a unique way to protect ourselves while still having our economy running. Because also, we saw that in the past months and last year, when we had to close down everything and there was no in uh, influx of tourists, that our hospitality sector was down. People who are working in the hospital, in the restaurants, who are the taxi drivers, the hotel workers, all had the reduction in their income. And so it was a really hard time for, some, for a lot of people at that time. I think for our economy, it's important that we are able to welcome tourists. And in order to be able to welcome tourists, I think the vaccination protects us and gives us an opportunity, provides us with an opportunity to keep on doing that. So that's why uh, that is one. Second is also the most important is what can your healthcare system carry? If you have uh, 50 beds or you have only six beds of in intensive care, you want to protect the amount of people that have a need of, of an intensive care bed. You want to prevent that a lot of people will need to come and show up at your healthcare facility. So vaccination addresses that because then you reduce the risk that you and now with the new strain also come with the new strains, you are trying to protect your patients, your population at, at this moment from getting ill so that we don't get a lot of people at the same moment who are ill and need uh, intensive care uh, care. So that is the reason why we need to vaccinate. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Ms. Butikais, did you have addition? Uh, um, he addressed it uh, toward the end, the muted strain. So the fact that the vaccination rollout is a, a race against time before those strains take over. And because they are far more contagious, we would have, of course, indeed the overflow of our healthcare system. Uh, and we also uh, need to be able to continue to access our normal healthcare system. I bet you that there are very, very a lot of people including myself, who may have skipped certain essential healthcare activities over the last year, which may lead to delayed diagnosis. If I ask 
around how many women may have skipped their mammogram last year. They couldn't get an appointment uh, and the hospital was busy, of course, with COVID. So it is very, very essential. And we are in a luxury situation maybe now that we don't have a lot of admissions, but that can change in a heartbeat. It's not, not a matter of when, uh, if these strains will come, it is only a matter of when. And uh, we really need to make sure that people from the get-go, accept the vaccine and don't say, I'll wait till the end of the year. We need to make that impact now and together choose the vaccination and really protect our country. And you will see immediately the burden of the disease drop tremendously. Thank you so much. Following question. Um, I've contracted and recovered from the COVID-19 virus. And as a result of this, my body has developed antibodies to fight against this virus. Would you advise those persons to, to, to still take the vaccine? If yes or no, why? I could say um, yes, you need the vaccine still. It has been shown that people who got infected with the COVID don't have an adequate immune system to protect them for the future, unless they have been really ill and they have been in the intensive care. Those people have developed a kind of immunity, but most of the patients who have got ill and uh, they do not have a long-term protection. So yes, you still require to take the vaccination to prevent you from getting another strain, to get it again, and to be worse ill than you were the first time. And there is a very, very a good example, of course, currently in Brazil, uh, Manaus, where uh, a very large percentage of the population had COVID-19, I believe 76% uh, was estimated to have been infected, where now reinfection is taking place and there is a disastrous healthcare crisis going on. So there's really very um, current proof that having gone through a natural COVID doesn't give you the lasting and strong protection and doesn't even come close to the supreme protection that a vaccine will give you. So regardless if you had COVID or not, you are urged to take the vaccine. Moving along, we have some questions regarding the logistics of the vaccine. Will there be enough vaccines on the island to receive the second injection in a timely manner? Absolutely. Um, yes, there will be enough vaccines for all persons to receive the second dose in a timely manner. And we do have guaranteed shipments. So part of the exercise was, you know, having communications with the Netherlands, giving them um, as, as accurate as possible population estimates so that we can account for all of those persons who will be receiving the vaccine. When do the vaccines arrive on the island and who will monitor the transport and proper storage? So the proper transport and storage, um, just like any other vaccine, will be monitored by a team of pharmacists. Um, the COVID-19 vaccine is no different. There will be um, strenuous and rigid uh, protocols and policies in place, um, which pharmacists have to adhere to on a common, on a common basis when they import um, any pharmaceutical. Um, and this is, is going to be the norm for the COVID-19 vaccine. Storage of the vaccine. Do the locations have generators in case of GB outage? Absolutely. Um, this is also requirements um, with vaccine storage. So there, there, there is um, sufficient generator generators, or there are sufficient generators available. Um, should there be a power failure of any sort? The COVID-19 vaccine campaign was expected to start next week, the week of the 15th. According, the Daily Herald now understands that this has been delayed by a week. Can you confirm this delay? And if so, explain what caused the delay? Uh, there is no delay of any vaccine campaign uh, as we are starting the kickoff right now with these information sessions. Uh, so everything has been um, sort of rolled out according to our schedule and plan. How do you register for a vaccination if you do not have a house doctor? Great question. Uh, so there is no need to have a house doctor in order to register for the vaccine. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there will be two options to register for the vaccine. This is through a web portal. And the other option will be through paper-based for those persons who are not able to register 
uh, electronically. These locations will be primarily at doctor's offices, select pharmacies, and various uh, and also distributed throughout various locations uh, within government, um, one being the government administration building. As this, um, as the information becomes available, we will make sure to communicate this clearly and publicly uh, through various media so that everyone uh, is, you know, given the, the proper time and the proper platforms to register. What I will say is that uh, the live, the link has gone live this evening and there are some minor, minor kinks that we are still working out. So I ask the public to be a bit patient, but for those of you that have registered and received confirmation, uh, please bear in mind that that information was received on the back end. Um, and as we are getting feedback, I'm actually on my phone getting feedback right now. I'm extremely happy about the level of enthusiasm, um, but of course with rollout of electronic and, and technology, um, there are you know tweaks that need to be made. So please bear, in mind that that will be done. Um, and thank you for those who have already registered. In a previous Council of Ministers press briefing, the public health minister stated that the ministry hopes to have all persons vaccinated before the start of the hurricane season. According to the Dutch language media in Curacao, this timeline is no longer realistic and that the kingdom government now expects everyone that wishes to take the vaccine on the islands that they can be vaccinated by September. Can you confirm this or does this old timeline still hold? So based on information that I've received, um, we have no indications that our current timeline um, needs to be revised. So as far as I'm concerned, um, we are sticking to our um, ambitious timeline to make sure that everyone is vaccinated before hurricane season. Okay, now we do have some more questions coming in from the Facebook page. One question directed to Mrs. Lisa De Weaver: why is there a five month stretch to vaccinate everyone? And why are essential workers last? So as we mentioned earlier, the five month stretch is to try our best to make sure that we can vaccinate a majority of our population um, early enough. And as Dr. Ragozing alluded to, there are you know, implications from a health perspective, a public health perspective, and even a tourism perspective. So while this timeline is a bit um, ambitious and aggressive, we are trying our best to ensure that we vaccinate a majority of our population to be able to um, have that herd immunity to protect those who cannot get vaccinated. Uh, with reference to the question about essential workers, um, the way that we have rolled out is that um, everyone 60 plus will receive first priority, including healthcare workers. And then the next group for that are persons who are age 18 to 59. Uh, so, you know, without focusing on a central worker or not, um, we are trying to also go based on age grouping um, yeah. rather than specifically focusing um, solely on profession. And in addition to that, if I may chime in, the um, other essential workers are not in the last group. So um, it is not correct. Uh, it's a healthcare with direct client contact who are in group one, then the people with underlying health conditions from 18 to 59 and other essential workers. And that is, for example, uh, teachers, people that uh, will be working at the airport to uh, receive our guests. So the essential workers are not at the end of the program. The end of the program is closed off with uh, people from 18 to 59 who have no underlying conditions. So the remaining general part of the population. Moving along, we have a question from Maria Chamont. So being a patient taking aspirin daily, she's asking if she will be able to take the vaccine. That is between Dr. Rago Singh and Dr. Dutz. Well, I don't think there is a contraindication with taking an aspirin. No, you don't expect to see fair bleeding from an aspirin tablet by, inject, by vaccinating somebody. That is not a reason not to take it. I would advise uh, Maria Chamont to take the vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. Um, a question from Wera Marcel Hodge. 
What if you give the vaccine to a patient and the patient has an adverse reaction while being monitored within the 15 minutes after being administered? I think that we need to observe that patient longer. We're not going to send you home. After that, those 15 minutes, we'll give you, if needed, medication. If the reaction and observe you for a longer time, um, there are mentions in the in, in articles that people who have a certain uh, a certain history, medical history, are being monitored for 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes. We'll have to look into that still. But we no, we're not going to send you home while you're having the reaction. We're going to treat you on the spot. And if necessary, then we will have to send you to the hospital for further follow-up. Absolutely. And it's very good to know for... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Eva, you go ahead. Go ahead. Now, what is really important to know for the public is that an allergic reaction like this, an anaphylaxis, is very well reversible with medication. So it's really important that it has happens very soon after the injection, so not four hours later when you're home, and it is very well treatable. I have a son who had an allergic and anaphylactic shock when he was very young from a Jack Spaniel, uh, it's been a sting bee, and it happened right next to the hospital by the swimming pool, and within minutes it was reversed in the ER with proper medication. So that is really, really important to know. There have been no deaths for anaphylactic shock after vaccination. It is a very reversible event, very rare, and we will be very well prepared for it at all vaccination locations with doctor, nurse, and every equipment and medication needed. So that should not deter you from taking the vaccination at all. Thank you. Ms. Boutiquet, um, I have a question for Ms. Boutiquet. I think you did touch on it, but we'll still ask the question. If elderly have underlying issues, can they still be vaccinated? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, underlying issues such as diabetes, heart disease, are absolutely no contraindication for vaccination. On the opposite side, they should be an encouragement to take the vaccine because when you have certain underlying conditions, you are at higher risk for having a very complicated COVID-19. What can happen is that we have seniors in our nursing home who are very, very frail and are of high age uh, and are so frail that we may choose in discussions with the family and the client to not vaccinate because you would weigh the benefit of the vaccine to possible risk of that person having a fever and becoming unwell, like uh, not wanting to drink and they might dehydrate and pass away. So those are very, very, very frail people and you would not just blanket roll out and inject everybody. You would have that personal discussion. But in general, underlying conditions, which are very common on St. Martin, which is obesity, diabetes, hypertension, are great reasons to register for the vaccine. Okay. Is there a possibility of latrogenic reactions, Dr. Deutz? Well, as we mentioned, one of the iatrogenic reactions <clears throat> we wouldn't expect is the allergic reaction. So that's that's something we need to take into account. But that's the one that's the most common. And with most common, it's relative, as we already mentioned. It's 0 0.5 in 100,000. So if you, if you vaccinate 100,000 persons, uh, you would expect one. So um, there is a possibility, although that possibility is extremely low, and any other non-expected reactions are even in a lower frequency. And I can refer back to the information we have from the United States, from 22 million people vaccinated, it's almost non-present. So if you're talking about the possibility, there's a higher possibility of you being struck by a meteor than having an iatrogenic reaction on the vaccine. So it's up to you to the choice. Thank you, Dr. Deitz. Um, next question, how many have died worldwide from taking the vaccine? Uh, we are not quite sure of those figures and we're not quite sure of dying of the vaccine. Uh, if there is any amount of people, it's extremely, again, extremely, extremely low. And the, the point is people need to realize that people tend to die during their lifetime. I mean, and there's also the fact that if somebody dies by other causes and he or she has just been vaccinated, you can't say that, you know what, uh, you died because of the vaccine. So if we compare those figures, and those were actually compared in, uh, in uh, some studies in the United States, 
there's a there's a extremely low risk of dying and uh, so how many i can say <laughs> very low amount thank you dr dait next question will we be getting a vaccine passport um Yes, you will receive a, a vaccine booklet. We're not talking about a digital passport that uh, I think Aruba was looking into, but uh, the vaccines will be supplied with all the equipment that we need to administer it, needles, syringes, everything, of course, but also with the booklet. And that's an official document which will have the batch sticker of the batch you have been vaccinated with, with the number in your booklet. And you should really take care of that booklet and um, keep it safe. Um, it won't immediately give you um, the right to travel all over the world and not having to do a PCR test. Um, you know, like a, here I am, I'm vaccinated, I can enter your country safely, simply because we have to wait for time to show us that you also stop transmitting the, uh, the virus. So you should expect that in the beginning you will still have to do uh, some PCR testing for traveling and also everyone has to continue with all COVID-19 preventative measures after completing your vaccinations. That is very, very important because we will have to wait and see for the data to show us that you will also stop transmitting the virus. It is very uh, much expected and the data from Israel is giving us a really nice glimpse into our future, um, but it will be a little while and then the government can, of course, make the decision uh, to abolish the preventative measures. But on your day of your vaccination, you cannot light your barbecue and burn your mask. Thank you, Ms. Butikes. Following question, Dr. Rago Singh. Question from Marie Louise. Are you saying that, for example, asthmatics, the vaccine is safe for those persons? Yes, it is safe. It is safe. Um, there is no, con uh, at this moment, there is no data that people who have asthma are at a higher risk to develop any re uh, reaction compared with other people. And yes, asthma is a kind of an allergic reaction of the airways, um, but no, there has not, no reports been coming in about the increased risk of that. So yes, for now, I think it would be probably better to take the vaccination if you weigh the benefit and the, and the risk again, because people who have asthma or those who have uh, uh, OSAS are a little bit more, and, and hypertension are a little bit more prone to have more severe reaction on uh, the virus itself. So yes, I would recommend to take the vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Rago Singh. Next question we have is, why is there not an option between Moderna and Pfizer? Um, we are being supplied with vaccinations from the Ministry of Health from the Netherlands, RIVM supplies that. And it's not like a McDonald's menu where we can choose uh, which one we would love to receive on our islands. That is uh, predetermined based on supply and on shipments that will go to the Netherlands and also, of course, on the local situation. For instance, Seba and Stacia will be receiving the Moderna because they have not received uh, the minus 80 freezer that is now operational on our islands. Logistically, for the size of the population there, that was not practical at all. So depending on the type of vaccines, uh, the availability, the volume, um, the vaccine coverage uh, to certain age groups, uh, Pfizer, for instance, being very, very, very good for the old population, having that really strong immune reaction, these decisions are made. So when you are registering for your vaccine and you enter our the clinic, you cannot choose which one you prefer to take. Thank you. Next question we have is, Holland does not have enough for the second shot. They're now saying instead of three weeks, it'll take between six weeks. Is that also okay? I think we don't want to reach to that situation. So I think um, that we are trying to uh, reserve for everybody who has, uh, who receives this first shot, that there will be a reservation made immediately for the second shot. Isn't that the planning, uh, Brecht here? Uh, um, yes, the two okay. shipments are completely guaranteed and uh, we will vaccinate with 
with a three week interval. Holland has made the choice to do the six week interval because their situation is different than ours. They have so much demand and not enough supply at the moment. And they're also racing against the British mutation. So they have consciously decided to vaccinate double the amount of people now and delay the second market stick to the three. Thank you, Ms. Boutiquet. Minister Panafleck. Thank you, Ms. Roach. I just wanted to reiterate what Ms. Boutiquet said. And our last meeting that we had, it was brought up and we have um, indicated that in our case, we will re remain under three weeks for the second shot. Um, that is very um, in our system of people, uh, how they are structured. That um, meaning that if you do not take the second um, second uh, injection and you leave time pass, you will have to start the cycles over. While if you take it and then within three month, weeks, you remember you have to go back, you will be um, advised to get um, your second shot, you will be done with that. And the, we agree that for Samarta, we will maintain the three weeks and not the six weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Panafleck. Following question, will there be any security or crowd control in the event of people getting aggressive at the vaccine centers? Yes, so there will be crowd control um, at each vaccine location. Um, and because it is appointment based, we don't expect um, lots of persons to congregate at each of the vaccination locations. Thank you. Next question from Leroy Hodge. What about people who are already taking medication for other medical problems? How would the vaccine react? If you're taking other medications and the vaccine, that depends on what type of medications you're taking. If you're taking medications that um, are suppressive for your immune system, there are some drugs that do that. You need to discuss this with your uh, general physician and the specialist. That means that you're still going to be able to be vaccinated, but we need to take into account probably that uh, one of the things that could happen is that the effect of the vaccine would be less. But that's again something to discuss with your treating physician and see if that's the case, then how to handle with being vaccinated. Following question, why vaccinate old people and not young people who potentially potentially have a longer lifespan? I think that uh, the, the, the vaccinations have not been tested on young people uh, yet. Um, what we saw, one of the recommendations from the, the vaccination providers themselves is that they are recommending an age bracket. Pfizer is recommending everybody above 16 and Moderna is uh, recommending everybody above 18. We will be recommending everybody above 18 to get vaccinated because of the advice from the pro producers. Maybe I can add something to that because um, I'm, I'm reading the question and it's probably also related to the group between 18 and 59. So maybe if the question relates to that part, there's another aspect that's also very important to realize. When you start a vaccination program, there is a vaccination program that especially relates to a pandemic. So that is when the, the, the virus is actively present. That's what we call a pandemic. And at that moment, your vaccination program will be geared up to the persons that the highest risk of becoming sick. So the same question, that same topic relates to the, the, the question, you're vaccinating not the younger people because they're probably the most resistant. You're vaccinating at first the ones that have the highest risk. Why do you vaccinate those? Because you don't want those to get into the hospital and burden your health care. That's why you start with the most vulnerable people during a pandemic. You get to them first, so you're getting the most vulnerable ones, and you're also vaccinating the ones that are in health care. So that part has to be covered. And then you switch to the 15, sorry, to the, the 18 to 59 uh, group bracket. 
And of course, those are the ones that are more resistant, but that's the, 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 the chronological way, the way you do vaccination during a pandemic. And that's because of the fact you don't want to overburden your healthcare system. Thank you, Dr. Deitz. Next question, once you take the vaccine, will you, be, will you test positive? If, if you're related to, there, there are two things we need to take into account. So um, when you get vaccinated, you are not gonna get the virus. So the testing, if the testing is done, the testing done in the lab is for the presence of the virus, the whole virus. So if you get a vaccine that doesn't have the virus in it, you're not gonna be tested positive. If you passed already through a, uh, an infection, there are some people that have remnants of the virus, but they're not infective, but they still keep on producing this for months. So there is a very slight chance that those people that are passed through the infection already get the vaccine and still there is some virus to be measured. But in a sense, people who haven't passed through an infection will never become positive because you're not going to get the virus uh, injected. Thank you, Dr. Deitz. A question from Leroy Hodge. We have we have many people on the island that don't have SZV. What will happen to these people in case of side effects? I think, uh, Brachia, you, you uh, answered uh, this question once in one of the previous, and I think we should be clear uh, about that. Brachia, maybe you can answer maybe. Um, if you If you have side effects, um, of course, these are expected to be very, very mild. So uh, side effects described, uh, besides, of course, the allergic reaction that we discussed at length, um, the side effects from the vaccine are mild headache, fatigue, some muscle pain. So these things are fully resolved within a few days and a simple paracetamol will uh, resolve that. Paracetamol is not covered by SZV. You would have to get that over the counter anyway. So uh, I don't see uh, an issue there. These uh, side effects are really mild. They fully resolve and can easily be solved with some paracetamol and some rest and then you feel your old self again. I think paracetamol is covered with only tw only 20 tablets. Oh, sorry, I stand corrected. Okay, so yes. if you don't have an insurance card, then you would have to indeed pay, spend a few guilders on the paracetamol, yes. Um, if there is no data to confirm that taking the vaccine limits the transmission, why not wait until this is confirmed? Uh, well, it is, it is, of course, very important to realize that the vaccines have been tested for not becoming sick. What we already know is the fact that without a doubt, when you get vaccinated, if you get infected, then you still produce less virus. That's what we know already right now. It doesn't take away the fact that you can transmit the virus, but by having a lower amount of virus, the chance that you can infect somebody else also becomes lower. And what we know from practice, those are the figures I showed from Israel, you see the effect immediately. So if you want to wait, then all of those nice figures that Israel already has, you're going to miss those. So again, from a practical perspective, it is very important to do. And the next thing we should look upon is if you get a, st a sterile uh, protection. If you get a sterile protection by the vaccine, you won't transmit it anymore. But you don't need to wait because of the fact that you need to see the effect on your community immediately. Thank you, Dr. Dice. Minister Panafleck? Oh, Minister Panafleck, I think got disconnected. We'll continue to the final question that we've received via the Facebook Live. Do you have to take this vaccine yearly like the flu shot since the COVID virus is constantly mutating? We know that there will be more pandemics in the, forth in the forthcoming 10 years, also with mutations. Do you think it's good medical practice for a person to be taking multiple booster vaccines every year? Isn't there a risk for the formation of autoimmune diseases in the body? Uh, I can ha I can answer that with, uh, with, with the last part or the resolute no. Um, we've been having people being regularly vaccinated for the flu year after year because of the fact that the flu virus mutates at a very high rate. 
So there is a program of vaccinating people yearly. So taking that into account and taking that as an example, the practice of vaccinating with the flu vaccine has been going on for years already, and there has been no effect, no spikes, nothing related to autoimmune disease. So that's one. So having a regular program does not relate to having more risk for autoimmune diseases. That's what we know, for instance, from the flu vaccine. The question is very relevant, of course, for something new. So something new like the COVID vaccine, like the COVID virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, it just has been uh, uh, detected in a year's time. So it, it's almost one, it's a little bit more than one year back that we detected the virus for the first time and it mutates. So we need to keep it monitored and we're not quite sure that the, you, you will have to have a booster after one or two years. But again, taking from example from the flu vaccine, that's something we need to take into account and that'll help us be, without making us sick again. And that's a trade-off we would all like to make. Thank you, Dr. Dice. As that was the final question, this does bring us to the end of the question and answer session. Panelists, thank you once again for joining us for this live panel discussion. For viewers, if there were any unanswered questions, please feel free to email those questions at vaccination at stmartingov.org and those will be answered in writing. Honorable Minister of Public Health, Social Development and Labor, the Honorable Richard Panafleck, Mrs. Lissa De Weaver, Ms. Butekes, Dr. Rago Singh, and Dr. Deutz. Radio listeners and online viewers, this brings us to the end of the live panel discussion for this evening, Thursday, February 11, 2021. For rebroadcast, tune in to St. Martin Gov Radio 107.9 FM, the official Facebook page of the Government of St. Martin, the YouTube channel Government of St. Martin and St. Martin Cable TV Channel 115. For video on demand, log on to the official government's website at stmartingov.org. On behalf of the Department of Communication and the Government of St. Martin, I'm Rolaika Roach and wishing you a pleasant evening further. Mm -hmm.